Good morning. This is Faith at Faith in Books. Um, I'm up here. Well, it's not early. I just got up, basically. Um, it's Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all those so celebrating, as a friend of mine always says. Um, hope you have a good one. Um, I'm kind of tired this week. I kind of lost my mojo reading-wise this week, just because a lot of things were happening in the world. And... You know, it kind of got into me, you know, got into my, my little bubble and uh, kind of bothered me the whole Ahmad Arbery thing. And there's a woman whose both sons are in the hospital right now with COVID-19. I don't know her personally, but I know a lot of people who do know her and her family. And um, so I keep getting the updates uh, online, be on Facebook and stuff. And so... You know, both her sons are, are just fighting for their lives, so that's that's a scary thing. And I don't know, there were other things that went on this week. And one thing that was stressful this week that sort of made me lose focus on reading was I am trying to apply for a special permit for a zoning variant so I can get backyard chickens. Because I did this really bizarre thing when the lockdown started. I thought, you know what? I have this garden, but what I really need are chickens. And so I just um, ordered four pullets, which are, you know, adult. I, I didn't get the chicks. I didn't want to have to deal with heat lamps and all that stuff. Um, and I wanted to know that they were laying hens and not roosters. I didn't want any possible roosters. So I just ordered four of the quietest, nicest chickens. And uh, they're coming the week of May 19th. And then when I realized that I had done this really dumb thing back in March, I didn't want to cancel my order. So there's a um, there's an organic little vegetable farm uh, about ten minute walk from here, and uh, it's sort of left over from when this whole area was farmland. And so we asked them, "Will you take our chickens until we get our permit? Because it's going to take." several months and they said yes because they already have chickens so so we've been dealing with that and then I've been trying to do all the paperwork for the getting the zoning variants and it is a nightmare it is so Byzantine not to insult the Byzantines but it's just it's so obviously a barrier to entry or or whatever I mean I went to law school a long time ago and I had to read the thing four times to figure out exactly how you do this. I mean, it's it's just so, and there's just so many things that you have to do. So I've been dealing with all that. Um, so it's crazy. So, so now instead of building two coops, because my son, my 25 year old son said he would build me a coop. But now it's turning out that he's got to build two. He's got to build a temporary one that can go sit over at this other this neighboring little, it's not, I guess it's a farm, but it's a very small, it's like a farmette kind of thing, um, can go over there. And then we're gonna have to have a permanent one that's approved by the county here. Uh, so anyway, I've been trying to get all that stuff together. It's been very, very stressful because you know every step really has about 10 steps to it and you can't make a mistake. They keep saying if you, if they're, if anything is wrong, you have to resubmit it. You have to start all over again. So, um, anyway, so that's that's the big adventure, but it's very stress-inducing. And then with all the other stuff. So, I can't even think. There were other things, too, I wanted to mention, but that was... <laughs> that's the funny one. That's the, the one that, uh, you know, my poor family just putting up with me and my quirks. Anyway, I was going to do the Sunday edition of the um, Maze for Magazine, and I sort of, I, you know, I sort of lost my, my zeal. I'm trying to regain it. Um, I haven't been doing reading very well since, since Wednesday morning, I guess, last time I, I put something up. But I did want to um, show this cartoon again because Alba asked about it. So I'm gonna put it up close so you can really see it. I don't know if you can read it or if that's backwards. But basically it says, uh, to conclude my talk on the theory of Catholic action. And you can see the speaker has his head up in the clouds and then everybody, his audience, 
they're all falling asleep and really bored. So that's the, the little uh, jab at Catholic action. I guess they weren't very much connected to the people they were trying to reach. This one is really interesting too. Can you see that? I'm gonna put it up close. It's, it's a guy, first of all, the Bible quote is, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but let your light shine before men. So that's the quote from Jesus. And then it says, uh, the, so, the social encyclicals, he's standing, the guy who's prying the lamp up is standing on the social encyclicals of the church. The uh, candle is the light of faith. And then you have secularism. And then up here you have the inactive layman is up on top in his easy chair reading the paper. So anyway, so doing more, a little bit more research into this magazine, Integrity, um, it is, it definitely was tied in with all the social, uh, uh, I mean, the Catholic action, uh, the young Christian workers, those sorts of uh, movements in the church prior to Vatican II. Um, so that's kind of neat. So at the time, it was kind of a com progressive sort of magazine. But now, uh, you know, it's hard for me to even talk about anything because I feel like it's controversial and I will offend people it, because it's so kind of, um, you know, maybe not considered PC. Um, so uh, this, this next, uh, I thought I would talk about January 1954 and February 1954. So the theme for January was growing old gracefully and I mean, it's not, it doesn't shy away from the topics. Um, you know, it talks about facing death. It talks about the death of your spouse or of loved ones. Uh, it talks about losing your independence and your health. It talks about worrying about money. Um, the funny thing is they don't ever use the word elderly like we do now. Um, it's all old people or old folks. Um, so that's kind of interesting and it does have a really sociological um, perspective this this magazine so you can definitely see Dorothy Doan's influence as a professor of sociology a um, couple interesting things from this first of all it talks about mercy killing they're already talking about um, how um, societal attitudes could lead to thinking mercy killing, or I guess we call it now assisted suicide, um, that the, the, the changing mores of society could lead to that. And of course it has, so that was, they were right there. Um, and I say there was an article, there was an interview. I'll get to it, hold on. Where is it? Should it be more organized? I just got up this morning and thought, oh no, I should do this. And I'm gonna get to it. Okay, so, and I should have got the books out. Oh, my hair is a mess, guys. Sorry. Um, this woman, Carol Householder, Houselander, I'm sorry, Carol Houselander. Uh, that's a name I recognize. I actually have a couple of her books. I have she wrote these really charming, exquisite uh, children's stories, and I have a co I have two collections, maybe just one collection. I should have looked. Anyway, I've heard of her before. She was a popular writer in England. She's from England um, in the '40s and '50s, and I believe she was a convert. Um, and she also I have, also have a collection of her meditations, different articles she wrote on uh, Advent and Christmas. Um, so. So she does an interview in this magazine. And the funny thing, and she talks of a family problem, and she talks about how, it's so funny, because now it's just the opposite. I, mean, I think she gets it, she thought she was onto something, and maybe it was an issue. But, um, you know, if people living together is a problem. But she talks about how it's really hard on the family when you're the extended family and the older people have to live with the younger people. 
So it says, uh, quote, this overcrowding and lack of their own home is one of the many reasons leading young men and women to dread the arrival of children. I mean, that's not true, is it? Because people don't live in extended families anymore. And they still don't have, we're still not having very many children. It is one of the reasons why countless children grow up knowing instinctively that they are just as unwanted as those most tragic of all tragic old people. Those who have become a burden to their sons and daughters. And, you know, this actually isn't true because now you know we pack old people off to nursing homes so that we don't have to deal with them and uh, you know people are still a lot of people are choosing to be childless or or um, or you know have one or two or whatever uh, limit the number of children that they have and um, you know that that really wasn't the issue I mean I guess anything can be a strain on the family if you if you let it be uh, the next thing, uh, the next paragraph is, it need hardly be said that the divorce court, with its thousands of broken homes where children's faith has been shattered, is adding day after day to the destruction of the idea of the family and to the difficulties of those who have grown old in disunited families. And now this was before no-fault divorce. This was 1954. So, I mean, it, it got worse and not for the reasons that she thought. Um, so the next one, uh, the next part is on mercy killing. I'm not going to get into that. Um, anyway, it, an interesting article, a, an interesting glimpse into how we were thinking back in 1954. You know what we got right and what we got wrong, um, and how uh, you know a lot of it is a little bit prophetic. You know that uh, that the issues. Um, that they were seeing on the horizon because of the shifts in in uh, our thinking um, did come to pass. Um, I went back to the book reviews, and um, I in this issue I don't see that many. One is a, a book by um, Alan Patton who wrote "Cry the Beloved Country," and somewhere I have this book. Too late, the fallow fallow rope. I don't know how you say that. So I've never read that book, but I think I used to have it. I don't just see. Here's a here's a, a book, Christian Ethics by Dietrich von Hildebrand. That's a name I hear a lot in theological circles. Here's a book by uh, F. J. Sheed, Frank Sheed. I talked about his publishing company last time. Uh, let's see who else is there in these book reviews. Here's Monsignor Ronald Knox. He's the uh, priest that also, he wrote a lot of books. He was English, uh, but he was the one that wrote the mystery stories and he was, his stories were included with Agatha Christie. He knew, he knew Agatha Christie. So anyway, so that's volume uh, January, 1954, Growing Old Gracefully. The one, this one is really interesting. February, the, the topic is scripture. And uh, it's really, oh, I've already gone 13 minutes. That's crazy. Okay. Well, anyway, this is a really interesting um, issue. Uh, one thing that's really interesting is one of the articles was a, it says a condensation of an article by Eve Congar. And I did, I had heard that name before. And I did research on him. He was really interesting. French Dominican priest. He was a POW in a German camp um, from 1941 to 45 or something. He got captured early. He was a chaplain. Um, he, he survived. Um, he became a huge force in Vatican II. He, his uh, expertise was in ecumenical um, things. Uh, and uh, reforming, I forget now what they said, but then afterwards he became more, uh, after Vatican II, he focused more on the theology of the Holy Spirit. Um, so he's, he's really super influential. Right before John the 23rd, though, the Pope before that, Pope Pius the whatever he was, 12th, I can't remember, um, he had been suppressed. His, his uh, writings and teaching had been suppressed, but then he got reformed under um, John the 23rd, and he became incredibly influential. And so this is an 
an article that's sort of, um, you know, condensed from something he wrote. And this is, was from an article in 1949. So he'd been out of the prison camp four years. Um, and it's about uh, Catholics and scripture. And it sort of belies the myth that Catholics weren't supposed to read scripture, which is just a myth that goes around. Even Catholics believe that one. Um, and maybe culturally in some pockets, they didn't read scripture before Vatican II. My family was not like that though. Now, my father was in the seminary for many years. He decided not to become a priest, obviously, but maybe because of that. But even my grandfather read, the, I don't know, it, it, that was not that was not true. It's another stereotype that in looking at my own life, it wasn't true. Anyway, it's this is really interesting, uh, the whole approach to scripture, which I could go into and go on and on about, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, but I do really find it interesting to see all these names at the end of when they're doing these book reviews. And let me just do, uh, finish up by doing that really quickly because this is long already. Uh, oh yeah, Reinhold Newberg. Is that how you say his name? Nyberg. He is a uh, Protestant theologian, but many Catholics really, uh, really like him, really admire his, his uh, writing. So that's written up here. Um, who else is there? I saw somebody else. Oh, this Helen Walker Holman. I don't know about her adult stuff, but she wrote saints books for children. I think that's it. I think that's all I can... Anyway, it's not a very in-depth discussion this time. I just was enough for it. Um, but I do hope that um, if you are celebrating Mother's Day, that you have a lovely one in spite of the state of the world right now. And uh, take care and I will post again soon. Bye.